Assalamu alaikum. This is Salam al Mariyadi with the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I'm very honored to have Linda Sarsour, the Executive Director of Empowered Change. And Empowered Change is a platform for digital advocacy, the, the largest for the American Muslim community. It is uh, akin to moveon.org for Muslims. And uh, I've actually known Linda for uh, quite some time. Uh, she actually applied uh, one time to our MPAC New York uh, office. And I think uh, it was a big mistake uh, not to have her. So this is the month of forgiveness, Linda. So please mm -hmm. forgive me. But I'm just reminded you about that. That was like a long, that was a long time ago. That was like, it was, it was like 19 years ago or something. That's crazy. It was uh, a little over 20. Or but maybe over 20. Yeah. It's counting. I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> but you went on to do bigger and better things, in my opinion. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, you know, for your, for your work uh, and, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, we, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the situation here in the United States. Uh, you just came back from uh, Nashville uh, and the situation of uh, members of the legislature who were kicked off and um, tell us a little bit about what you saw what you saw, you know, where, where you feel this is impacting America in its moment and and impacting our American Muslim community. Yeah, I just came back from Nashville this past week. And one of the reasons why I was there is because I'm actually a friend of one of the representatives who was ousted, um, which is Representative Justin Jones, who's actually a great friend to the Muslim American community in Nashville. He's very well respected. And actually was not the front runner when he was running for um, that office. He actually ran against the woman who was at the city council already and had elected office. And our Muslim community in, in partnership with other communities really helped this young man um, go to the state legislator. So um, and I so I've known him and, and I just felt like because I've you know, I've been there, uh, Salam, I've been, um, uh, you know, someone who understands what it means to be under attack and to be, you know, uh, kind of feel that kind of pressure and as a young person he's in his 20s as you know so I feel a, a lot older and a lot more wiser and so I went out there and we've been a group that I'm with uh, helped to organize um, with local people some of the uh, mobilizations that you saw um, and you know it, it I tell people all the time it doesn't actually matter what issue you care about um, what does it matter what kind of area of advocacy you're a part of the minute that any party majority thinks that they can expel people in a legislator that they do not agree with, then that means that there's no democracy. Um, the idea of democracy is we're supposed to have different people of different political parties debate, uh, argue, come to consensus, pass legislation that um, uplifts the American people. So the minute that you don't agree with someone, and because you have more power because of your majority, you could oust people, that harms all of us. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, I don't care if you're a leftist or on the right or whatever this, you know, the directions that people use to describe people based on political affiliation. So thank God that there was um, an opportunity to reinstate both of those members based on a process that was unprecedented that hadn't happened since the 1800s. And hopefully the message that was sent across the country to whether they're Republicans or Democrats, that you cannot oust people from a legislator because you don't agree with them. It's, just, it's, not, it's not how democracy works. And so I'm very proud of the people of Tennessee, including our Muslim community who was out there. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but one of the leaders of the city council of Nashville is a woman by the name of Zulfat Swara. She is the first Nigerian American woman to go to elected office in the United States and a very proud unapologetic Muslim who led the efforts to reinstate representative Justin Jones in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, that's, that's incredible. And we don't know. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, we, 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 uh, uh, we should, uh, acknowledge that uh th that is a misstep on our part for not knowing great people like that so thank you for bringing her to the limelight um uh, for us to know and we'll try to engage her uh, as we move on um you know the issue of, of social justice then uh where where do you see the movement for social justice in america uh, as it relates to policies like uh gun control and gun violence as it relates to the threat of, uh, uh, of, of white supremacist violence that's targeting communities and houses of worship, uh, as it relates to uh, economics and equity in pay and affordable housing. 
I know there's a lot there, but if you can choose some issues that you feel are really important for us to keep in mind and assess where the movement for social justice is. You know, Salam, I think our movement is exhausted. We're tired. I think the 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 ways in which we've had to organize over the last like six years, um, especially under the Trump administration, it was constant. It was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, looking at what is to come down the pipeline. Uh, now watching the kind of different, um, you know, uh, decisions coming out of the Supreme Court, um, knowing that our Muslim community really has no recourse in this country. Um, back in the days, we used to think that if we went to the Supreme Court, because it was the highest law of the land, that might have been a place that we got some sort of justice. But now we know that our issues, and we've seen this happen with the Muslim ban, um, we lost in the Supreme Court. And so it's kind of like we're in a situation where um, we live in a divisive country politically. Um, there are groups that are, are leveraging that divisiveness, leveraging sensitivities of our communities, pin, pinning people and communities up against each other. Um, and I think it's very dangerous and it's dangerous for politics, it's dangerous for our communities. I think as we saw in Tennessee, the reason why those two representatives were ousted was after a mass shooting that cost the lives of three nine-year-olds and three adults. And those uh, two representatives literally were protesting with young people who did a walkout across the city to come and say, please protect us, protect the children, not the guns. And the response of the Republican majority there was to oust the representatives who stood with the children instead of being empathetic to the calls of children who are saying, listen, at least we want to be safe in schools. As you know, every day there's a mass shooting. In fact, the same day that Representative Justin Jones was uh, reinstated was a mass shooting in Louisville, Kentucky, where I actually lived for six months back in uh, 2020 during the Breonna Taylor murder case. A, a guy walked into a bank and murdered people um, that were in the bank. And this is something that's a daily occurrence in America. We just saw a piece of legislation pass in Florida where Governor DeSantis, who thinks that he's going to be the president of the United States, actually put forth new guidelines where you can conceal carry weapons in the state of Florida without a permit and without training. So that means we could just be walking around the mall around people who are carrying guns that do not have permits and do not have training on how to use those weapons. And so I think that we're far away from gun reform in this country. So Second Amendment is a very divisive issue. I support people's right to have guns. I, we, it's not, it's not, the movement for gun reform is not about taking people's guns away. It's about creating laws and background checks and ways to restrict people who shouldn't have guns from having guns. And if you're not those people, then you should be on the side of gun reform in this country. You know, we're still fighting for a federal $15 wage, Salam. You're in LA, I'm in New York. Like $15, you cannot live off of $15 an hour in New York. It's just not gonna happen. You're gonna have to have a second job to live. So the fact that we're still $15, on a federal level, still fighting for $15 wage, shows you again that yes, we have come some based on labor and labor organizers, fast food workers and others who've been on the front lines, but that's the minimum wage. We should be actually fighting for a living wage. So I am not trying to be pessimistic, but I feel like we still have a long ways to go. And I think that this the ways in which we organize politics in America is extremely divisive and it's not centered on values and principles. It's centered on this idea of competition and who's gonna win the election versus the people. Yeah, and it's uh, you know it's it's a shame that it's easier to get a gun than it is to register to vote for some people. That's right. Um, and uh, in terms of wages, we see uh, these these multi billion dollar trillion dollar companies uh, not pay taxes, uh, but the average uh, person has to work on fifteen dollars an hour, and then the middle class is paying. Uh, for uh, all of the needs and social services. And if, and then in certain states, they just cut out these taxes and therefore there are no social services. That's There's right. no services for these communities. So we, we do have a long ways to go. Um, and, and I ask about that because, about social justice, because when we're discussing Palestine, people say, well, what does social justice in America have to do about Palestine and what's going on in terms of gun violence? And and uh, affordable uh, living and affordable wage. And, and I think the answer is everything. Mm -hmm. If we're not equipped to deal with our issues on social justice here, how do we expect the world to listen to us uh, about what's happening in Palestine? Um, and, and of course we saw the gruesome and horrific pictures uh, of Israeli soldiers 
uh, beating Palestinian worshipers in Al-Aqsa during Ramadan one more time. Um, it happens every year. Uh, and yet the United States government, its only action is to block a UN Security Council resolution condemning uh, that violation of religious freedom. So uh, first of all, just I, I want to ask you, when you first saw those pictures, where were you? What did you think? Um, what what happened after that for you? You know, I was watching those pictures actually from St. Louis. I was with a wonderful Muslim community out in um, St. Louis. And, you know, as a Palestinian American with family in Palestine, it is absolutely outrageous. I actually went to Palestine this past summer. So I was in Jerusalem. I was in Al-Aqsa. I was on the exact land where we see um, those things happen. I was in the Al-Aqsa Mosque to the exact same place where we saw them uh, laying down men who were praying on the ground where we saw a woman literally sitting on a chair with a blood spattered hijab. So it, 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 it just enrages me every time. And as you know, in Ramadan, this is a calm and peace and tranquil time for Muslims. And I just felt like my entire blood boil. And, um, and, and, you know, you said this earlier, Salam, and I think it's important for people because this is a debate that we have all the time in the movement where people say, why do you have to bring Palestine up in this? You know, what does Palestine have to do with the social justice movements um, that we're part of right now? Well, first of all, there are many Palestinians who are in the social justice movements in America. And so for us, we are not going to remove our identities or hide our identities um, because it makes some people uncomfortable. Also for us, as we come to the table as Palestinian Americans, as Muslim Americans, there are things about who we are and our identities that bring us to the table. And so for me, Palestine is this global social justice issue of our time. And it is akin, no matter what anyone tries to say, to South African apartheid back in, in the 90s, where we saw so many of our colleagues um, who are now our seniors in the movement who stood up and fought against South African apartheid. And guess who was the opposition? The United States government, right? So even we as the United States of America, as we, we celebrate figures like Nelson Mandela as we talk about the end of South African apartheid. And to be clear, as you know, in South Africa, I'm actually going there in June. You know, it's not, the, it's not, the apartheid isn't a totally over and the mm. people of South Africa will actually tell you that. But of course there was an official end to apartheid and it wasn't, it was because of student organizing, students on college campuses across the United States and across the world. And, and for us, when we even think about the things you said, affordable housing, the closing of hospitals across this country, the fact that we, we are one of the few major countries in the world that do not provide health care to all of our citizens, right? When people, and they say, they said Bernie Sanders, as an example, was idealistic. You know, what do you mean health care for all? And I say to people all the time that one of the areas, even if you don't care about Palestine, we send, we have sent trillions of dollars to the Israeli government um, over the decades. And I always say to people, if the American people had a chance to decide where their money went, I know that the American people would not send their money to an apartheid regime that oppresses people, that engages in an illegal occupation. I know that the American people would say, put my taxpayer dollars in schools, put them in services and mental health services, put them back on infrastructure, bridges and roads and buses that people need across this country. And so I think the connection for us here as we watch military spending, we could re redirect a lot of that money back into our communities. And we could also hold any country accountable that uses US taxpayer dollars, our hard earned money. I mean, you know, the folks in our community, Salam, some are working two to three jobs just to make it, just to pay their mortgage. And to know that some of their resources that they're paying the United States government goes to oppress other brown people and other marginalized people across the world is not something that I believe the American people support. And it's probably something most Americans don't even know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so what's our responsibility? What, what, what do we do to let the American people know? By the way, the shift in the polling is significant. Mm -hmm. There is now more uh, Americans supporting the Palestinians than than before, mm -hmm. um, even within the Democratic Party. Right. Uh, definitely uh, a significant significant shift, but it may not be for a while uh, before you know the the Democratic leadership uh, actually uh, responds to that. At, at this point, they remain oblivious. At, you know, they're ignoring it altogether. Uh, and uh, what what will it take to see that manifestation of the the popular sentiment uh, 
uh, seen in our political arena. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think you're right. It's going to take us a couple of years to actually see any movement on a political level based on the current administration and potentially future administrations that we have. I think we're seeing a younger generation of elected officials on the city, state, and federal levels that eventually one day will come into leadership and power, and we will see potentially movement there. We're starting to see the sentiment change. We're starting to see more challenging of the Democratic Party from some of their ranking members, as we've seen recently. Um, in kind of two situations, we see we saw a letter from Senator Bernie Sanders and Jamal Bowman, who you know is in New York, uh, a letter basically calling on the State Department to investigate um, funding to Israel based on some of the violations of human rights that they're committing. And they're basing it on some old law we had called the Leahy Law. That law has been there for a long time, but the fact that we have these new members of Congress willing to challenge our government and call for these investigations, I think, again, is, a, is really a reflection of the power that our movements are, are beginning to hold and influence. I think in the meantime, and you know the Salam, maybe a decade ago, um, it was extremely controversial uh, or less, or, or 2023, yeah, so it was a little bit over maybe 15 years ago. It was extremely controversial for people in our community to stand up and call for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions of the Israeli government. And there were a lot of young people at the time that were ahead of their time. They took a lot of risks of being marginalized in our communities because of their call to support boycott, divestment. And what we've seen recently is very interesting. I saw a letter from over 200 um, business leaders, many of whom uh, pro-Israel business leaders or some of whom were Jewish themselves, who basically wrote a letter to the Israeli government saying, if you engage in any judicial reforms, we will boycott and divest our businesses and money from the state of Israel. Oh, we, oh, that's, and it made me chuckle. That. <laughs> yeah, and it made me chuckle because I said to myself, yeah. hmm, sounds like boycott divestment to me. Right. And so, so I say to people all the time that sometimes we don't have to wait for our governments. I think that everybody knows that. And it's been a tactic that has been used against many governments before, including within within the United States, like the Montgomery bus boycott. I think in the meantime, we all have the power to support boycotts on divestment. If you are an American business leader who has you know, investments in the state of Israel, if you have colleagues who have investments in the state of Israel, being able to say, listen, I will remove my investments. Um, I will divest my resources and my businesses. So as long as you are not upholding human rights and as long as you continue to violate the human rights of the Palestinian people, we will no longer do business with you. And believe it or not, in this world that we live in, it's sad that it's the truth, money talks. Um, and that's when the Israeli government, I think um, on the recent judicial reforms, as you know, they have delayed those decisions. But I believe based on this idea that there could be major boycotts and divestments from people who are generally pro-Israel or pro the state of Israel. So I think for us as, as at the, in the meantime, you know, the boycott divestment movement um, has been gaining ground over the years. Again, it is our way, Salam. It's one of the only ways we have in a nonviolent, for us to choose a nonviolent means to say to the state of Israel, if you don't want to be boycotted, if you don't want people to, to divest from you, uphold the human rights of the Palestinian people, grant people justice, end the occupation. Um, and I think without that and without our government in play, that's the only kind of means we have in this moment. Well, you and I have both, both been accused of being anti-Semitic for our views uh, on the Palestinian-Israeli issue and our criticism of the state of Israel. Uh, it's become a badge of honor, I think, uh, at least uh, we always consider that, you and I, but more people are considering that it is a badge of honor, that if you get accused of anti-Semitism for uh, criticizing the state of Israel, then, then so be it. Uh, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to be silenced. Uh, however, there are groups now, and I saw this in a Sunday paper, one-page ad by the World Jewish Congress, demanding that the president criminalize uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions (BDS) as a part of the package to deal with anti-Semitism. So they are conflating the two, um, and it is on the desk of many people in the government. I know that because that's what they tell me that they're being pressured to make it criminal. Um, if it were, you know, to give us your thoughts on that. Do you do you, do you believe that it will uh, uh, lead to uh, criminalizing BDS, which, as you said, is one of the few nonviolent options available to us now? And if you keep cutting off nonviolent 
resistance, then you complain about the violent resistance. You know, you can't have it both ways. You're cutting us off, and then you're saying the only thing that they see is violence in the Middle East. You know, uh, Sanam, I always laugh at the at, at these legislations are sitting on desks in city councils and state legislators. They've been sitting in Congress for a really long time, and, and it's just a distraction. You know, we have First Amendment rights in this country. We have constitutional right to boycott, divest. I can divest and boycott the fossil fuel industry, pharmaceutical industries. Um, there, It's not just the state of Israel. I can boycott China for their treatment of Uyghur Muslims. I can boycott any nation state. Um, and you don't even find these types of opposition. You don't have lobbies of other countries trying to criminalize us boycotting these kind of other um, um, entities. But what's interesting is that what, what I hope people get from these legislations is that once we allow them to, which they will not be able to do, but we still have to challenge them. We have to, we have to counter lawsuit. We have to fight for our rights. But once you allow them to go down this route for criminalizing a free speech when it comes to the state of Israel, then you open the doors for people uh, from the fossil fuel industry to also want to push legislation to block people from divestment and boycotting of the fossil fuel industry, et cetera. So again, it opens up a lot um, and, and starts encroaching on other parts of people's lives, even if Palestine is not a priority issue for them. As you know, these laws have been challenged. So for example, when we look at the case of Bahia Amawi in Texas, you know, CARE sued the state of Texas alongside the Center for Constitutional Rights um, and the ACLU because she was a speech therapist. And when they wanted to renew her contract, they're asking her to literally take an oath that she will not engage in activity of boycotting the state of Israel. It, and if she didn't sign that uh, attestation, she would have basically not been able to be a speech therapist and speech pathologist in the city of Houston, which by the way, she was one of the only Arabic speaking speech pathologists in that entire Houston district. And you know, our community is quite vast in that area. So across the country, it's been, it's been um, challenged in New York. It's been challenged in Georgia. So that means we've tried the South. We tried the North. I think that it's not going to really go anywhere. What I think I want people to pay attention to um, is the IHRA definition. And that's where these laws try to conflate the two together. In order to have the law, you need to have the I IHRA um, uh, definition. And basically that definition is one that they are trying to basically cement in legislators across the um, country, uh, in academic institutions, uh, in, in many of the corporations, et cetera. And the 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 the, the IH, IHRA definition of anti-Semitism in fact centers the criticism of the state of Israel. So it does not, it literally conflates the criticism of the state of Israel with anti-Semitism. And for me, Salam, as you said earlier, you can call me anti-Semite from today till the day that I die. I will continue to be a vehement critic of any state, including the state of Israel engaging in violation of human rights against the Palestinian people. And for me personally, I'm Palestinian, so I'm not exactly sure what people expect Palestinians to feel about what's happening right now in, 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 in Palestine, Israel. But for me, I think that the weaponization of anti-Semitism has been extremely dangerous because you know this, we live in a country where there's real anti-Semitism. There are white nationalists who want to harm Jewish people. We have seen attacks on Jewish individuals. We've seen attacks on synagogues. I mean, we have had mass shootings at synagogues. We've had kidnappings. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on and on. And so for me, I always call on fellow Jews, even those who may not agree with us when it comes to the state of Israel to say, listen, we don't agree with these people. We're probably not going to have dinner with them, but we also are going to stand against the weaponization of anti-Semitism in the case of Israel and Palestine, because disagreement is different then saying that Salam and Linda and CARE and, and, and American Muslims for Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace and all these people who are on the front lines are the enemy, because we are not the enemy. We are actually, in fact, the opposite. We are the people in this country on the front lines of civil rights, of civil liberties, of defending the Constitution. And so, again, it's a dangerous time that we live in, but I do feel pretty confident that those legislations will not go far and we will not ever get into a situation where we, where we will be criminalized for abiding by the constitution, the protections of the constitution, unless something crazy happens and somebody decides to amend the constitution of the United States of America, which I don't see happening any time in our lifetime. Well, there's something else and I'll get to that later, but, um, and that, that deals with the, you know, invoking national security. Uh, anytime the U.S. government invokes national security, they get their way in the courts. 
uh, but but we'll talk about. I, I want to go stick to this topic about anti-Semitism uh, and, uh, and and pro-Israel groups because, as you said, you and I and many people in the civil rights community are working to protect Jewish centers and Jewish communities uh, from uh, targeted violence uh, by white by white supremacists. The same white supremacists, by the way, who support Israel because they hate Jews. That's right. Uh, they they want to see. The, the second coming and Armageddon and so on and so forth, uh, so that it gets to the point where Jews have to either convert or uh, perish. Uh, where, whereas uh, I think we Muslims are a lot more reasonable uh, and that our religion says that Jews are a protected community, that synagogues must be protected by Muslims, that Jewish worship is, is, is something that uh, is in Sharia, the Islamic law, uh, that has to be uh, not only allowed, but uh, supported. Uh, so uh, there, there are so many things that we can talk about in terms of what we've done to fight uh, anti-Semitism uh, and uh, targeted violence against Jewish communities. Uh, yet it is not uh, the same now uh, since we are critics of Israel. We are critics of the government of Israel. Um, and that paradox is something that, you know, to this day, you see this uh, keeping the United States behind in terms of addressing with this problem, that we're a secular democracy, yet the only foreign policy that we allow the, uh, the blurred line, if not the violation of separation of church and state, is our policies toward uh, the state of Israel. And what's happening in Al-Aqsa, uh, unfortunately, is 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 exhibit number one now in terms of how the Israeli government has disqualified itself from being the ones who have jurisdiction uh, over uh, the the Temple Mount and the, the noble uh, sanctuary there. So when it comes to uh, religious freedom, the only place that the United States does not comment on is Jerusalem, the holiest uh, of cities, the holy city. Uh, according to all of our faiths, and so how do you how do you how do you deal with that from an advocate that you 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 can protest, you can uh, leverage some kind of uh, economic uh, uh, way uh, against uh, these powers, or you can negotiate with them, or you get people voted in. How do you see that? Uh, wh where are we in that trajectory right now? I think we're still, you know, in all. The playing all those processes or engaging in all these processes. I think one of the things that's important for people to understand, and we said this earlier, this is not the first time that um, Muslim worshipers have been under attack um, during the, the, the holy month of Ramadan. And we've seen this on Eid al-Fitr, we've seen it before. I mean, we have, um, Empower did this kind of like calendar to show really show people imagery from different years where this has happened before. I think the, the important thing also is to understand that the Israeli government has leverage over the, the storytelling, the narrative here, right? So there's a lot of propaganda about who these people are that go to the mosque, about the, quote, men that are these radical, you know, and, 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 and the story never starts 75 years ago. We are in 2023. This is the 75th year anniversary of the Nakba. This is when the state of Israel was created, the expulsion of Palestinians, the murder of Palestinians, the destruction of villages of, of over 450 villages. That's where the story starts. You know, a lot of times the Israeli government plays on the ignorance of many of our fellow Americans. They use these buzzwords. They say Hamas, Hamas, everything's Hamas. And I, I a few times I've actually had this conversation with colleagues and people who don't know much about Palestine. I said, did you know that um, uh, the, the Hamas was created in 1987 and they were like, what? And I said, yeah, 1987, the state of Israel was created in 1948. So explain to me from 1948 to 1986, um, you know, so that there's this, this idea that because people don't understand the technicalities around speaking about Palestine, that the Israeli government can throw out terminology, like for example, using Hamas as they're, you know, blaming Hamas for everything. When my question to you is, what about the the illegal occupation, the brutalization of Palestinians, the destruction of homelands, the stealing of land that happened before even 1987 came along and, and before intifadas and before all the kind of propaganda that's being used right now? And I say to people, there's a, actually a quote that I always use in cases when we talk about police violence. 
there was a, a investigative journalist in the civil rights movement, a woman, a black woman named Ida B. Wells. And uh, she said this, Salam, she said, um, those who commit the murders write the report. So when people, for example, tell me in a police violence case, but the police report said, the police said, and I say to people all the time, Ida B. Wells taught us that those who commit the murders write the reports. And in the case of Israel over the last 75 years, Israel has been the press release um, and the media has quoted the Israeli press release. And until social media came around and the Palestinian journalists and people on the ground started using social media and actually showing you videos unfiltered by mainstream media, I feel like that's also where the shift happened. You cannot deny people's their, their eyes. You just can't do that. You cannot deny an American, uh, someone in, you know, a French person, a person in uh, the UK or in South America, if they see a video and we see you beating elders, we see you beating children, beating women, we see you literally forcefully evicting people from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah. We have seen raids on communities. We saw the shooting of Shirin Abu Akle. Like you cannot deny people what their eyes see. And so I think social media has been a really effective tool for Palestinians to really start interjecting and inserting on the usual narrative of the Palestinians are the savage, the Palestinians are the people that have no ability to govern themselves. And somehow the Israeli government is, you know, the one that's maintaining order, which is the excuse they tried to use for Al-Aqsa, that they're the ones, we don't need Israeli soldiers to maintain order of our Muslim prayers. Um, and so that should be the question also in Al-Aqsa, why are Israeli soldiers in military gear even policing us during our holy month of Ramadan. And mm -hmm. what I will say, Salam, is you know, if this happened in any other nation in the world where an occupying power was harassing, targeting, hurting, harming people of any faith during their religious high holy holidays, the world would be up in arms. Um, and I hope that this time around, there were more people up in arms in ways that I hadn't seen before. And we hope that that continues as we continue to build allyship and show solidarity to other communities and really do the political education. Um, because like you said, I think a lot of it is because people just don't know. Uh, they don't know. And, and also there's a concerted effort to silence people that they cannot talk about this issue. Um, and, and you see that happening with uh, several of the pro-Israel groups here in the United States, uh, such as the case of you know, demanding that the president uh, shut down uh, any criticism of Israel, because that, as you said, based on the IHRA definition uh, of anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism. And so that resolution is now, I believe, uh, has been adopted by 30 cities. And even though they say it's non-binding, uh, I can see that eventually people will take that resolution and make some executive order uh, to that effect. Um, so we have a long ways to go. And, and I wanted to, you know, uh, on the issue of uh, national security, this, the, the topic I wanted to go back to, when you see the national security policy of the United States, um, it is still, you know, as Edward Said said, it is based on three pillars in the Middle East, uh, supporting compliant dictators, uh, controlling the oil supply, and maintaining Israel's military advantage. That, I mean, people can talk foreign policy all they want. At the end of the day, those are the only three things uh, that you see happening, even though you hear all this uh, uh, talk about peace and diplomacy and regional stability and economic uh, development for these countries. Uh, in Iraq, you, you have uh, the, the greatest uh, oil producing, one of the greatest oil producing countries in the world, yet the people are not seeing the benefit from that. They still have to live every day with lights uh, being interrupted, electricity interrupted every night. And they, they, they don't have that economic boom that people uh, are, are claiming uh, to have happened. Uh, so there are so many problems in the Middle East. And when you go and challenge the United States government on that, just like it was on the Muslim ban, the United States government says, well, this is a matter of national security, and they get their way in the courts. So we are then uh, given the option of more political advocacy and more protest. 
the problem I see with the political advocacy is that there still hasn't been that uh, crystallization or that that the coalescence of groups to really work in, you know, with with a not, it doesn't have to be one voice, but more synchrony uh, on the issue. Um, and I see that even within our community, people are canceling each other out. That you know, you're accused of being a sellout, or you're accused of doing this and that, and then, uh, and therefore you say, okay, well then my community is not ready, so I'm not going to do anything. And and there isn't that effective action. How do you see then our movement mature to the point where we can have multifaceted approaches to this problem, and not say, you know, it's either my way or the highway, which has been unfortunately the impression that we get uh, as pe as people want to work for this issue, but if they want to work with it in in ways other than protest, they they feel that they're marginalized within the movement. I think that's an important um, discussion, and I think it's something that I've um, you know thought about a lot over the years about what it, what does it take to really fight for Palestinian liberation and freedom in this country. I think that you know you are, you are right that that not everybody's going to have the same approach. We're going to have the organizers and the protesters. We're going to have the pro Palestinian elected officials. We're going to have the more kind of folks that work in the political realm, then you have other folks who are working in the larger solidarity movement, um, doing some of the more kind of strategic political organizing amongst, you know, the climate justice folks and trying to really connect issues and be intersectional in the way to bring more people to the issue of Palestine. Um, so everybody has a different way of organizing. I think the, the issue, Salam, that comes up for our community on this issue is, you know, we all we we don't have to all do the same things, but we all have to work from the same principles. Um, and I think that the the there there has been some confusion um, about um, you know what is going to free Palestine. And I think, for example, as you know, there was a big controversy around this MLI program that you saw for many years was criticized. And I think even some people who went on it eventually came out saying, you know what, you may be right, or the people that were criticizing it may be right. I think this this idea of of normalization is really important. That yes, we could sit in rooms with people um, that we don't agree with politically, right? That is just the, the norm. That's normal politics. You know this. Oftentimes, we meet with members of Congress who don't align with us all the way on this issue, right? We may be able to get them to sign on a piece of legislation, may get them to sign on a letter, but when you fundamentally look deeply, they probably don't align all the way on an issue like Palestine. I think the 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 place where we have to come together is to say there are certain organizations that we have to deem problematic and deem actually in opposition to the the work that we're trying to do. So for for example, AJC and ADL are not people that I can see as actual true partners to helping get to the place in Palestine where our people, where there is an end to occupation, where there is um, some sort of reprieve for our people. There may be other organizations that we may not wholeheartedly agree with all the way, but are still not actively opposing us in our work. And that's the thing that I think is key here. Um, you know, when I watched, you know, when I watch organizations supporting this current right wing fascist government, these people can't be our friends. I mean, it's like us saying, Salam, that we, people who are visceral supporters of Donald Trump are probably not going to be people that we as Muslims are going to go to and say, hey, maybe we can work on this one issue together and maybe we can move forward on this. So I think that's kind of where we have we have to be a bit more sophisticated and feel a little bit more influential that our real allies are going to be progressive Jews and they're going to be uh, the climate justice movement. We're, it's going to be the the gender justice, the 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 racial justice movements of this country, the immigrant rights movement of this country, the people who are you know pro health care for all, those are the people that you could already tell have principles that already align with you. We have um you know Jews, Jew, for example, in New York, we have Jews for racial and economic justice, Jewish Voice for Peace, Jews against Islamophobia. We have college student uh, uh, groups across the country that have shown us over and over again their unequivocal solidarity with the Palestinian people. We've actually also seen their evolution on this issue. JVP just recently in the last few years endorsed boycott divestment sanctions and in fact labeled themselves an anti-Zionist organization. That was not actually JVP 
eight years ago or 10 years ago. So again, I think we just need to be clear about where are there times where we could work with people that we don't always agree with, but where are there times that we have clear people, clear organizations that are in absolute opposition to the work that we are trying to do? I mean, just recently I saw a post from the ADL criticizing Jews in Israel who are against the this fascist government. They had a sign where they were trying to compare Benjamin Netanyahu to Pharaoh. And guess what? They called it anti-Semitic. Not you and me, Salam. Jews in Israel who are standing up against their fascist government, they were called anti-Semites for comparing Benjamin Netanyahu to Pharaoh. So again, that's, I think, the, the area. But I, but I think going back to politics, and it's another area that our community wasn't always sold on, especially some young people, that people said electoral organizing is not the way, that is not the ticket to liberation, in which I agree, but it is definitely a means and a tool for us to use now. So I think our focus as a Muslim community is electing more uh, folks who are better on this issue of Palestine, being able to organize our money better, just like other communities do around issues that are meaningful to their communities. Some people organize their money around healthcare or around reproductive rights or around immigration and immigrant rights or around racial justice, police accountability. Everybody else does it. I think we as a community need to start organizing our money around issues that are important to us. That means building more political action committees. That means building more C4 organizations. We are, we probably have nationally, maybe, and I might be exaggerating, maybe three to four C4 registered organizations, meaning groups that can do more political lobbying work versus C3 nonprofit organizations. Again, we have also as a community a long way to go to be more sophisticated in our politics. Yeah, and and unfortunately, as you get involved in more uh, uh, government work and political work, groups like the ADL and the AJC are are part of that. I mean, the ADL is part of the hate crimes network here in Los Angeles. I'm sure they are in New York and uh, throughout the country. They're part of the leadership and uh, uh, conference on civil and human rights in Washington D.C., where practically every uh, organization is a part of. So you have to engage with them. Uh, that doesn't mean we agree with them, uh, but there there has to be a discussion on how we can navigate that. Yeah, uh, so. I, I think that's a distinction, um, uh, Salam, because you know there's a couple of Muslim and Arab organizations that are also part of the leadership conference, as an example, right? I think the difference is that when the ADL is sitting on a, a city table, or you're going to a table, for example, the mayor's office says, "Salam Mariati, come to a meeting about hate crimes," and you show up, and ADL is there. I don't, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, I I sometimes find myself in a space where they happen to be there or a major conference around uh, democracy and they happen to be on another panel down the hall for me or whatnot. That's actually not what I'm talking about. I think what people are, what people get, re, what react to is when the ADL has a conference and that people from our community go to their place, when they are taking their invitations to be in their spaces. I think we we cannot get around that AJC and some of these organizations that are extremely problematic and are attacking our organizations and leaders that they will be in those spaces. And we're, Can you we're explain, yeah, just to, to to those that are not familiar with the history of all this, why the ADL and AJC are are problematic. What what is it well, that you you consider to be the 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 clinching point on not engaging them directly? I think, um, you know, the, the, for me, the most dangerous is the ADL because the ADL is still seen in some circles um, progressive and still seen as a civil rights institution. Um, the, the, the ADL has a long history and for folks who want to read a bit more, there's been actually a report that was written about it that I think would be extremely telling for folks. And, and, and it's called, it's on the, if you go to the dropadl.org website, you'll actually read this report. They have a long history beyond us as Muslims and Palestinians. Um, you know this. They have a history of spying on Arab American organizations. Um, they have a history of working with um, law enforcement institutions, especially when there are these high moments and cases around police accountability, police murders that happen across the country. As you know, for many years and a long time, uh, apparently they stopped some of it. I don't know. But um, for a long time, they were actually facilitating the training of police officers from the United States in Israel to be trained by Israeli police and Israeli military. They have actively worked against student organizing on college campuses when it comes to um, uh, organizing around Palestine and organizing for justice. 
they have a whole dossiers on a lot of our groups. Um, you know, many of our national Muslim organizations, including Mass Care, others. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure that uh, MPAC is on there as well. They are a, a very problematic group of people. They support the IHR, IHRA um, uh, uh, definition. They also, as you know, are big supporters of these anti-BDS legislations across the country. And you would think as a civil rights group that the ADL would say we absolutely disagree with people, but oftentimes we know that their leader has also come out publicly recently saying that, um, saying that anti-Zionism is unequivocally anti-Semitism. So making very big claims um, that I think are extremely dangerous. As you know, the ADL oftentimes gets um, quoted by uh, lots of media for their kind of work and data that they have around hate crimes across the country. And so again, they have proven over and over and over again that they are in opposition um, to our community. We watched what happened to Keith Ellison when he was running for DNC chairmanship. Um, these organizations um, are not our friends. And like you said, there might be still in spaces that we uh, go to based on the work that we're doing. And that's fine um, because we're not gonna give up our seats at the table because the ADL is there. But what I think is important is that we do not take their invitations and we do not allow them to use anyone in our community to make some sort of claim that we are friends and we are, you know, while we're also attacking a lot of these institutions and frontline organizers, um, they've attacked, as you know, they um, went after the movement for Black Lives, when the movement for Black Lives included their support of boycott, divestment sanctions, and freedom for Palestinians, they actually went public and they criticized a major movement in this country who has shown unequivocal solidarity with the Palestinian people. So we could sit here for days and name those, but again, to your point, Salam, this is not for me, uh, you know, I'm not, I mean, everybody's gonna organize differently. So you're gonna find another person that's gonna sit in my seat today and probably tell you a whole other situation and maybe explain this differently. I understand as a political organizer that I do have to sometimes be in space with people that I don't agree with. And sometimes you're actually in space with them on another issue that has nothing to do with Palestine. So for example, refugees and issues around national security, et cetera. And we find ourselves on these tables um, across the country, um, especially in these kind of political spaces. But again, I think us being cognizant about who we are reaffirming um, when it comes to the, working on our issues, as long as we're not giving credibility to people who are actually in opposition to our work, that's the most important thing for me. So I think when people mean normalization, I don't think they mean that, oh, you went to a mayor's meeting or a commission or you know, a human rights commission and you showed up to a table and these other people were there. I think it's more so about partnerships um, and being doing work that, that basically says this group is a credible group. This group is a partner. This group is going to help us progress and move our work forward. That's the kind of work that I think where people will be vehemently critical. And then sometimes, I, you know, we call it cancel culture, but I think people will then say, wait a minute, is this Muslim group our friend? If they're willing to work with people who are actively opposing us. And I think that's where they mean what they mean by when they say normalization. Uh, much more to discuss. Uh, I want to just end with uh, asking you, so if there is hope, where where do we find it? Where, 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 where should we pursue these uh, opportunities or movements that is giving us hope? Hmm. Oh, I, if I didn't have hope, Salam, I'd go find myself a nice nine to five job somewhere and do something else with my life because I'm exhausted. Uh, the hope is in young people. I have been, um, you know, around young people for, you know, a long time, but in, in specifically just looking at the last five years, I mean, the young people running March for Our Lives and the gun reform activists on the front lines, you know, these young Black organizers, the indigenous organizers, even our young Muslim organizers on college campuses, that's where the hope is. They are strategic. They don't carry a lot of that old political baggage that we have. They're fearless. There are many of whom are not people who are like a lot of our young Muslim Americans whose parents came here to this country or grandparents just feel very independent um, in their way that they organize. They don't feel loyal. They don't feel afraid because they're immigrants, you know, or not, you know, or because their families were immigrants. That's where the hope is. I'm watching. Um, we have some of the most incredibly organized Muslim student associations on a lot of the college campuses that I go to. I've seen, um, I've been invited to events where it's like, Black Student Union, 
the Muslim Student Association, Students for Justice in Palestine, just watching the intersectional organizing and watching our young people show up for issues that may not even sometimes impact them directly, that's where the hope is. They're going to be the new leaders of our institutions. They're going to be running for office across this country. They're going to join the ranks of the Rashidas and the Cory Bushes. And, um, you know, and I will say this, and you know this, Salam, Dr. King, when he went and did his speech before he got assassinated, he said, I see the promised land. I may not get there with you, right? But, you know, the, the, you will, and our future generations will. So maybe you and I may not see all the fruits of the labor, we may not get to the quote promised land, but I definitely believe in the next generations that they will absolutely get to the promised land. Yeah, and, and what Martin Luther King said was very prophetic. He, he was a prophetic voice, and the prophetic voice tells us that the struggle is multi-generational. I mean, right. when you think about the prophets, Abraham built the Kaaba, had a, an ummah, a community of three, himself, his wife, his son, and prayed for the prosperity and security of, of, of his future generations. Moses was told to liberate the children of Israel from Pharaoh, which he did. And then they got to the desert and they weren't ready. And God said, wait. So that was the end of Moses' mission. Jesus came and spoke the word. And within a very short span of time, he was gone. And even the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, came and established uh, a just society and established a, a new way uh, of, of, of faith and, and social interaction and uh, uh, employing mercy and compassion. And then his mission ended. They all knew that they could only do so much in their lifetime, but what they could do, they had to do. And I think that's how we have to look at our work. We do what we can to move the ball forward and then ask the next team to come in and and right. take over from there. So I appreciate all that you have done in that short span of 19 years or whenever you first applied. Yeah, oh yeah, that was, yeah. I, 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 I literally got to go look up that email now, yeah. just remember. No, no, don't, don't bring up that. <laughs> we want to, we want to, uh, uh, again, say thank you for all that you do. Um, and, and thank you for uh, being that voice uh, and making us all proud. Um, that passion that we hear in every word that you speak is something that uh, I find very inspiring. So thank you, Linda. Assalam. Thank you so much. And Ramadan Kareem to all of you. Um, out there. And uh, if I don't get to connect before that, Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak. And may the last 10 days of Ramadan be the best. Ameen, Ya Rab. Ameen. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.